All right, we'll get into our final presentation for the course. This presentation is covering project event trees. Our objectives are to define and explain the purpose of project event trees, identify the types of functions that are used in project event trees, demonstrate the process of constructing a project event tree, and then discuss the importance of project event tree descriptions. First, an overview of project event trees. The project event tree is a graphical representation of all elements within the general event tree framework, hazard, system response, and consequences. It's constructed on a level-by-level -level basis with each level defining a new variable. We're gonna to touch more on levels in a few slides. And the project of entry is ordered sequentially from left to right in an order of operations basis. <clears throat> Why do we use project of entries? They serve as the blueprint for the total project risk calculations. They identify all the variables used in the risk analysis and define them as continuous, discrete, transform, or other. We'll discuss those terms more in the coming slide. Furthermore, a project of entry shows the relationship between the variables and the order that the risk calculations are performed. They serve as an order of operations guidance. They ensure that all elements of the general of entry framework are captured within the risk analysis and that the relationships between those variables and elements are correct. Finally, project of entries provide a graphic for decision makers to help them understand the variables included in the risk analysis without having to dig into the computations themselves. The project of entry and descriptions serve as an executive summary for the risk analysis and the risk calculations. Here's an example of a simple project event tree. Over the next few slides, we're gonna highlight some of the common features that all project event trees share. Our first feature is project event tree levels. Levels are used to define the project event tree in relation to the general event tree framework. They can correspond to the main elements of the framework, hazard, performance, or consequences, or their sub-elements. A single level will always correspond to a single element or sub-element of the framework. So for instance, a single level will not be used to represent performance and consequences simultaneously. The level numbers do not correspond to a specific element or sub-element for every project of entry but they're instead just used as placeholders to facilitate easier discussion of the elements included in the risk analysis. So therefore, not every project of entry has the same number of levels. Um, and level numbers often represent different elements or sub-elements from project to project. Our next feature are the nodes. While project event trees are used as placeholders for the elements and sub-elements of the event tree framework, nodes are used to introduce and represent the functions or variables that are used to evaluate those elements. A given level will always contain at least one node, but may contain a group of nodes. Just as with sub-event trees, branches emanate from each of the nodes of the project event tree. Branch probabilities represent the probability of the event or the branch conditioned on the occurrence of all the events that precede it or, to, or are to the left of it in the tree. We discussed conditional probability earlier, and just as before, the probabilities emanating from a single node must sum to one. Not all nodes contain multiple branches. As you can see in this example, level two only contains one branch. When that's the case, the node only has one possibility and has an associated probability of one. The next feature um, that we're going to discuss uh, and the final feature in the tree is the end nodes or are the end nodes. 
Again, these represent the same thing that we saw with the sub-event trees. End nodes are where the tree ends, and they represent failure or breach, the red triangles, or non-failure and non-breach, the green triangles. Next, we're going to discuss the different types of functions that we use and see in project event trees. This example project uh, and project event tree encompasses all of the possible project event tree functions or variables that we can use. The function or variable types are continuous, discrete, transform, system response, exposure, and consequences. The next set of slides are going to walk through each of those function types and define them and discuss their common applications and risk analysis. But remember, while we will use the level numbers in this example event tree to reference the different function types, this is going to look different for each project in practice. The first level in this example represents a continuous function. So remember, continuous functions are denoted by those blue fan symbols, and they represent continuous random variables that can take on an infinite number of values over a specified range. In practice, we represent continuous functions using a series of branches, like the ones shown in the box to the right. Depending on the project conditions and the potential failure modes that you're evaluating, you may only need a few branches or you may need more. Now in this example, each branch represents a range of reservoir elevations and has a corresponding probability. Together, those branches are both mutually exclusive, meaning they can't occur simultaneously, and they're collectively exhaustive, meaning they cover the entire range of the flood hazard. Continuous functions are most often used to represent hazard variables, such as peak flood stage, stage duration, spillway inflow or outflow, river flow, or earthquake ground accelerations. However, they can also be used for other applications, such as spillway reduction due to debris blockage. The next function that we're going to discuss are discrete functions. Discrete functions are used to represent discrete random variables that can take on only a finite number of values. Within a discrete function, each value is represent, represented by a separate branch. The number of branches is selected to match the number of discrete values that the variable can take on, and each discrete branch has an assigned probability of occurrence. As with the continuous function, the probabilities of the discrete branches emanating from a single discrete variable must sum to one, and they are mutually exclusive and also collectively exhaustive. So one example of a discrete random variable would be a, uh, a radial or tanner gate failure for a spillway containing two tanner gates. This example contains three discrete branches, with the branches representing zero spillway gates that are inoperable, one spillway gate that is inoperable, or two spillway gates that are inoperable. One spillway gate being inoperable can't occur at the same time that two spillway gates are inoperable. They're mutually exclusive, so each one of those scenarios gets its own branch. Eventry diagrams can become very large if they are fully developed at each level. So while the risk calculations for the entire event tree need to be completed to arrive at the final risk estimate, the portrayal of the event tree can be simplified through the use of collapsed nodes, which are indicated, like we said in our previous presentation, by these plus signs. When a plus sign appears in the tree, it signifies that the structure of the tree is identical to the branch above it. So in this example, the one gate failure and two gate failure nodes contain plus signs, Therefore, the structure of the tree after those nodes is ident uh, identical to the zero gate uh, inoperable branch. It's important to distinguish the structure of the tree from probabilities within the tree. Just because the structure of the tree following the one gate, um, one spillway gate inoperable and two spillway gates inoperable branches are the same as the zero spillway gates inoperable, 
each of the succeeding nodes in the event tree, levels three through level nine, they may have different probabilities of occurrence than the branch above it. The plus sign just represents collapse node where the structure of the event tree is the same. Levels three through five contain transform functions. As their name implies, transform functions are used to transform values of one variable to another variable without the chance node. So in other words, transform function branches have a probability of one. We can use set relationships that can help us transition from one variable to another, such as inflow to outflow, inflow to peak stage, or peak stage to overtopping depth. Performance and associated consequences can be functions of different loading variables than what was used to define the initial hazard function. And much of the time, they, uh, they're going to be a function of pool, but they can be a function of a lot of other things too, like overtopping depth or spillway outflow. So being able to use a transform function to move from one variable to the next is very useful. There's a question in the chat, do probabilities of zero, one, and two spillway gates inoperable have to equal one when summed? The answer to that is yes. So these, uh, all, all of these nodes need to be collectively exhaustive. They have to sum to one, yes. The next level in the tree, level six, contains system response functions or failure functions, if you prefer. Uh, these contain the potential failure modes that are evaluated in the risk analysis, which with each potential failure mode being represented by a single branch within the function, and that branch contains the system response probabilities conditioned on the transform function values in one or more preceding branches. So in other words, as we discussed in the previous slide, the system response probabilities can be functions of a variety of variables like stage, peak ground acceleration, or spillway discharge. The system response function is where our sub-event trees that we've been discussing so far in this training come into play. The branch probabilities for each of the potential failure modes are estimated using those sub-event trees, and then they're fed into the project event tree to calculate the total risk. Each system response function also contains a corresponding branch for non-breach to satisfy the requirement that each project event tree node be collectively exhaustive. Exposure functions represent the fraction of time that a portion of the population at risk is exposed to a dam or a levee failure. At a minimum, we consider time of day in our exposure branches, since most people are usually in different places during the day than they are at night. At night, they're usually at home, whereas during the day, they're typically at work. At least that's the way things used to work pre-pandemic. Post-pandemic, it might be a different story, but here we are. Another example might be weekdays versus weekends. Time of year can sometimes also be important, like if you have a popular camping area that will have more people in the summer, or a ski resort that will have more people in the winter. The number of branches that you'll need to compile your exposure functions is going to depend on how the population at risk for your project changes at different times, days, or seasons. Then finally, the end of the project of entry contains consequence functions that represent economic or life loss consequences for various types of initiating events, potential failure modes, exposure conditions, or other preceding event combinations. To get the consequences associated with dam or levee failure, you'll need to use incremental consequences, which are the total breach consequences minus the non-breach consequences. So that question, do the probabilities of zero, one, and two gates inoperable have to equal one when summed? I wanna add a little bit of a caveat. The answer to that is yes, but, but on occasion, there will be a particular branch or branches of an event tree that combine for an insignificant proportion of the total risk. When this occurs, these branches may be able to be pruned from the event tree if the removal of the branch or branches significantly reduces the complexity 
of the event tree. There's two different methods for pruning that we can consider. The first method is to eliminate the branch or branches that don't significantly contribute to the total risk altogether. So this method is the simpler of the two, but it also violates the event tree rule that all branches must be collectively exhausted. When the low risk branch is eliminated, the probabilities within that branch will no longer sum to one. Now, this violates the rule of probability that all branches must be collectively exhausted. However, if you notice the relative probability of a two gate inoperability scenario is much, much, much smaller than the probability of having zero gates inoperable or one gate inoperable. So while in theory we're violating that rule of probability, in practice, we're cutting out a very, very insignificant portion of the total risk. So it's something that we're willing to live with for the sake of simplicity. The second method of pruning would be to incorporate the probability of the low risk branch or branches into another branch. So in this example here, we could take the probability of a two gate, of having two gates inoperable of 0.0001 we could simply add that probability to the probability of a one gate inoperability scenario of 0.04999. While we will still evaluate this branch as though it's a one gate inoperable scenario, the probability of the branch of 0.05, it actually represents the likelihood that one or more gates will, will fail to operate on demand. So using this method, the branch probabilities will sum to one. The collectively exhaustive event tree rule is still satisfied. However, it's prudent to note that the difference between the two methods, method one and method two, it's going to be insignificant and likely won't make a difference in the final risk estimate. Now, <clears throat> although it can be advantageous, the act of branch pruning should be done with extreme care to ensure that the risk estimate or uncertainty characterization won't be significantly altered. When pruning of the event tree occurs, the risk team should document their reasoning or basis for the pruning and revisit the potential failure mode description to determine if rewording or adjustment is necessary. So when pruning branches, we have to ensure that the event tree complexity is significantly reduced and the risk estimate or uncertainty characterization won't be significantly altered. All right, so now we have a, a quick knowledge check here. Go ahead and log into Socrative. We have uh, our first knowledge check question. Project event tree nodes are used to A, identify and define the step-by-step -step progression of a potential failure mode, B, calculate conditional probability of failure for a PFM, or C, identify and define the functions or variables of the general event tree framework. All right, so the correct answer for that knowledge check is C, identify and define the functions or variables of the general event tree framework. That is the purpose of project event tree nodes. And then as a follow-up, Anthony answered, um, yes, Anthony, you're correct. When we, when we provide the probabilities of a one gate inoperable, two gates inoperable, that is wrapping all of the specific, the different combinations of gate inoperability together. So when we say the probability of a one gate inoperable scenario is 0.05, that means that that represents both the combination that gate one operates and gate two does not, and also the scenario where gate two operates and gate one does not. So that is all encompassing of all of the possible scenarios or combinations of a one gate inoperability. Hopefully that helps. All right, we're gonna follow up with another knowledge check here. So here we have an event tree graphic. We've highlighted level two. The highlighted level is represented by which type of function? Consequence function, transform function, or discrete function? The correct answer for this question is B. This is a transform function. So notice that there is only one branch associated with this level, and we are using this level to convert from our original hazard of stage frequency. So out of the stage frequency curve, we will get a peak stage for the reservoir. 
and we need to convert that peak stage into an overtopping depth so that we can evaluate our PFM1 overtopping. Overtopping will be a function of overtopping depth. Therefore, we need to transform our peak stage into the overtopping depth that PFM1 is a function of. So this is a transform function. So now that we've, that we've defined project of entries and types of functions that we see in project of entries, let's discuss the typical process that we use to construct a project of entry. First step of the construction process is to identify the necessary variables for the project of entry. This can be done by working through the, gen the general of entry framework, work through it sequentially to make sure that each element is correctly identified. So first, we have our hazard. This will include our initiating event, any operational performance elements that will change or exacerbate the initiating event, and transform variables that are necessary to evaluate the potential failure modes for the project. Make a note that in project inventories, operational performance elements should always be placed ahead of system response functions and not on the same branch as them. We tend to get caught at times only considering operational performance, such as gate reliability or debris blockage, in one potential failure mode, such as overtopping, but not for the other potential failure modes for the same project. Operational performance affects the hazard for all potential failure modes being evaluated, and as such, it should be appropriately placed in the project of entry before the system response functions. Next, we cap, uh, capture the performance element. This consists of all the risk driver potential failure modes being evaluated for the project that will be included in the risk calculations for the total project risk. Finally, we have consequences, which is composed of the correct exposure scenarios and losses that we're interested in calculating. Once all our variables have been identified, we use step two and build the event tree structure. In this step, we look at our variables and we determine the number and the order of the project event tree levels. The order of the project event tree should flow from left to right and should follow the general event tree framework, hazard first, performance second, and consequences third. If you have a project of entry that contains multiple transform functions, you need to provide a distinct level for each transform function in the tree. Once the order and the number of the levels are determined, define the function type as well as the number and description of the branches for each of the levels. And then finally, establish the proper relationships between the potential failure modes in the tree. These relationships will determine how the system response probabilities are combined in order to calculate the total risk and will be used later when we discuss the project of entry description. The final step in the construction process is to fine tune the event tree structure. At this point, our project of entry has been built and it is functionally and mathematically correct so we can stop after step two if we wanted to. But if we use step three, we determine if there are ways that the tree can be streamlined by evaluating the possibility of having collapsed nodes or pruned branches. Collapsed nodes allow for the graphical portrayal of the project of entry to be simplified, and it doesn't affect the final risk calculations. The branch pruning also serves to simplify the graphical portrayal of the tree but remember that it does affect the risk calculations. Uh, furthermore, depending on the method that you use to prune your branches, the project of entry may no longer be technically mathematically correct. Uh, when pruning is performed correctly, however, that mathematical difference in the risk calculations is going to be so insignificant that it's not going to make a difference when you start to look at the numbers. So these actions of fine-tuning the event tree uh, they're typically going to be restricted to project of entries that contain discrete functions. You're not usually going to see collapsed nodes or pruned branches 
for projects of entry that don't have a discrete function um, contained within them. All right, let's do another knowledge check. Multiple transform functions can be defined within a single project of entry level. Is that true or false? So the answer to this question is false. Remember, when we have multiple transform functions, we need to provide them each with their own unique level within the project of entry. If you have three transform functions, you need three distinct levels to deal with them. Since the probability is associated, the probability of that transform is one, and we're only transforming from one variable to one variable, we can only contain one variable within each level of the tree. All right, now let's move on to a project event tree description. We've discussed project event trees. We've discussed the construction process for project event trees. How do we describe project event trees? The project event tree description is used alongside the project event tree structure to provide additional context for the tree in a report. The project event tree description is as important as a potential failure mode description in that without it, it would be difficult to pick up the report and determine what the risk analysis team was thinking. The description is written in a level specific format so each level has its own description, and it defines the relationships between dependent variables in the risk calculations. A project of entry description can be built in a bullet format, with each bullet representing a level in the tree. And the bullet for each level should include the level description, the function type, whether it's continuous, transform, discrete, it should include the, the relationships between dependent variables and the interpolation method used in the risk calculations to calculate the values for that level, if that's applicable. And it should also include the risk model that was used to combine potential failure mode system response probabilities, again, if applicable. The risk model will only be appropriate to discuss when describing the level that corresponds to system response functions. All of these items are important and they assist the project of entry structure to serve the role of a blueprint for the risk calculations. So let's walk through an example of what a project of entry description is going to look like. Here we have a project of entry with an initiator of a flood hazard in level one, a discrete function representing gate and operability up to five spillway gates in level two, a transform function in level three, system response functions in level four, and consequence functions in levels five through seven. First, level one. The description for this level is a continuous function for the relationship between peak stage and annual exceedance probability. Z-variant interpolation is used to calculate the annual exceedance probability for peak stages between those that define the peak stage frequency relationship. So we take this description and we can break it down by the five elements that are listed at the top of the slide. First, this level doesn't represent any system response functions and there aren't any pruned branches or collapsed nodes. So therefore, those elements, risk model and fine tuning, they aren't applicable for this description. The level description is underlined in red, and it defines the purpose of the level. This level defines the relationship between peak stage and annual exceedance probability partitioned by peak stage. So the level description is what is this level doing? The function type is underlined in blue at the beginning of the description. So this level uses a continuous function as defined by the blue fan symbol in the project of entry. So we specified that this is a continuous function in the level description. And then finally, we have the relationship between dependent variables and the interpolation method used for this level underlined in green. So in this case, we have 
z-variant interpolation that's being used to calculate the annual exceedance probability for peak stages between those that define the peak stage frequency relationship. Now, what that means is we might have peak stages that are defined in the stage frequency curve. We could have pool 100 and pool 110. Well, if we want to know what the, the probability or the annual exceedance probability of a peak stage of 107 is, we have to interpolate between those points on the stage frequency relationship to get that annual exceedance probability. So what we're doing is using z-varied interpolation to calculate or interpolate the probability of a peak stage of 107. Don't get too caught up in z-variant interpolation or logarithmic or linear at this case. We are just looking at examples here, and when you perform a risk analysis, that's when you'll dive deeper into the methods that you're using and make sure that you're capturing everything correctly. So here we have the same format for level two. And for this level, we have a discrete function for the probability of spillway gates failing to operate on demand. For this branch, the three and four gates inoperable scenarios, they've been pruned because they don't have significant probabilities of occurrence. And the one, two, and five gates inoperable branches, they contain collapsed nodes to signify that the event tree structures for those branches is identical to the zero gates inoperable branch for all of the succeeding nodes. So your event tree description will capture the reasoning for all of those things. So we have in there that the four gates failing to operate contributes insignificantly and has been pruned, and we have collapsed nodes for one, two, and five spillway gates failing to operate such that the structure is identical to the zero gates failing to operate branch. So you need to specify all of that in your event tree description for that level. Next, we have level three, a transform function used to calculate a resultant peak stage from the stage frequency relationship in level one and gate and operability in level two. So this is an important caveat here. Since we have potential gate and operability, our spillway outflow is going to be affected depending on the number of gates that fail to open. So the same inflow event that leads to a peak stage with zero gates inoperable is going to lead to a different peak stage when you have one gate inoperable or two gates or five gates. Therefore, we have to have a transform function in level three to calculate the resultant peak stage based on the number of inoperable spillway gates that we have in level two. Level four is our system response function. And for this level, we also need to include the risk model that is being used to combine the system response probabilities for the total project risk calculations. Now, for this example, we're specifying that we're using the competing risk model, but there are various models that can be used, such as the common cause risk model, the competing risk model, exclusive risk model. That's all depending on the needs of the project, and defining all of those models is outside the scope of this course. If you're interested in learning more about the different types of risk models used in risk calculations, I encourage you to sign up and take DLS 105, Risk Tools and Calculations for Risk Assessments. But it's important for this training to recognize that when you have a system response function, the description for that level needs to specify how you're combining probabilities to arrive at your total project risk. Then to finish off, we have levels five through seven, which represent the exposure and consequence functions for the project. Level five contains the exposure function. So here, make sure to specify the exposure weights that are being used. In this case, exposure is developed for day and night scenarios with the day exposure equal to 0.45 or 45%. So 45% of the time, the population at risk will be in their day location or start in their day location. And then the night exposure is uh, given a, a value of 0.55. And you can see that those two are collectively exhausted and that they add up to one. Level six is a consequence function for estimated life loss. The top branch of the level represents non-breached life loss, while the remaining branches represent incremental life loss or breached life loss minus non-breached life loss. 
For this project, non-breach life loss is a function of peak spillway outflow, and breach life loss is a function of peak stage. So we need to define all that in the level description. Then finally, level seven is a consequence function for estimated economic costs. It's virtually identical to the level description for level six for life loss, but it rec represents the economic loss instead. At the end of the day, you're gonna have a group of bullets that together comprise each level in the project of entry. Now, this is obviously too many words for a presentation slide, so you're not expected to read this. You can read through all these bullets on your own if you like, they're just a summary of all the bullets from the past seven slides, but this is what you will include in a report right here. And then this slide provides best practices for the inclusion of project event trees in risk assessment reports and briefing presentations. The project event tree graphic and the project event tree description must be included in the risk assessment report for reference. For briefing presentations, only the project event tree graphic should be included. However, the team should be able to describe the key aspects of the pro, uh, project event tree and project event tree description during the presentation, but when you're giving a briefing presentation, you don't want to throw this up on the slide, up on the screen. Nobody can read that. Nobody's going to take that in. So for the purposes of a report, we include the project event tree graphic and the description, and for a briefing presentation, we only include the project event tree graphic, but the team has to be able to speak to the key aspects of the project of entry during the presentation. All right, now we have a couple more knowledge checks. Knowledge check number four, for each level, the project of entry description should discuss the following. Function type, level description, interpolation method, or all of the above. All right, very good. D is the correct answer to that knowledge check. Each level of the event tree description needs to discuss all of those items. Very good. <clears throat> all right, now let's, um, let's step through some examples of how to build a project event tree using the elements of the general event tree framework. So these are fictional examples. Hopefully they'll be illustrative. Um, so let's go through a couple. So our first example is going to be for the fictitious sharp top down. Our initiating event for this project is a flood, and we're evaluating two potential failure modes, backward erosion piping and concentrated leak erosion. For our consequences, we're interested in life loss and economic costs. So our first step in the construction process is to identify the variables present in the risk analysis. And just as with the sub inventory construction, this table and the table on the, on the next slide are being used for illustration purposes, and, and they can be helpful for bookkeeping, but you're free to use whatever method you'd like to complete this step. So this table is set up so that each element is listed from the hazard all the way through the consequences, and if the risk analysis contains one of those sub-elements, a green check mark is assigned. If the variable that falls under that sub, and the, the very, I'm sorry, if a risk analysis contains a sub-element, a green check mark is assigned, and the variables that fall under that sub-element are included in the table. If a sub-element is not present, then a red X is assigned. So for Sharp Top Dam, our initiating event is a flood. There are no operational performance elements that we're evaluating. The next two components, transform variables and potential failure modes, are somewhat interrelated. In order to determine if transform variables are required for the project of entry, we need to determine which variables, the potential failure modes, and the life flow, and the consequences are functions of. So in this case, the two PFMs being evaluated are both functions of peak stage, and also our consequences are functions of peak stage. So we can determine those from our stage frequency relationship uh, from the flood hazard. Since we already have the variable that we need to evaluate our potential failure modes and our consequences, we don't need to transform that initial variable into any subsequent variables. So we don't have any transform functions for this project. For performance, we list the potential failure modes that are being evaluated. 
And we also identify the non-breach component. This is to ensure that the system response function in the project of entry is collectively exhaustive. And then finally, we have our consequence components in exposure and losses, both of which are present in this example. After identifying our variables, we move on to step two and we build our entry structure. This step involves determining the number of levels and defining the function type, number of branches, and branch descriptions within each level. One of the benefits of the table from the previous slide is that it organizes the order of the project of entry levels for us. So since it's set up to follow the general of entry framework of hazard, system response, and consequences, all we have to do when we get to this step is create an appropriate level for each element. Level one consists of our initiating event of a flood, which is represented by a continuous function for the stage frequency relationship. Since this is a continuous function, there's only one branch. Level two consists of the system response functions. We know we're evaluating two potential failure modes, and we also need to include a branch for non-breach. Therefore, this, branch, this level has three branches. Level three consists of the exposure function. For this analysis, we have a day exposure branch and a night exposure branch for a total of two branches. And then finally, levels four and five consist of the consequence functions for life loss and economic cost, respectively. Each of these levels, we're only evaluating one variable, so they only have one branch. And our final step is to evaluate the project of entry to determine if there are opportunities to fine tune through the use of collapsed nodes or branch pruning. For this example, there are no opportunities to do either of those things, primarily because there isn't a discrete function in the tree that would make it a good candidate. Using the information from our three steps, we're able to draw the project of entry for Sharp Top Dam as shown here. So we have level one, our stage frequency, level two is our system response function, level three is exposure, and levels four and five are consequences. Are there any questions about this example before we move on to another one? All right. Our next example is for wide range dam. For this risk analysis, our initiating event is a flood and we have a gated spillway with three spillway gates. Two potential failure modes are being evaluated those are overtopping and slab jacking and spillway erosion. And the consequences of interest, again, are life loss and economic costs. Just as with our previous example, the initiating event is a flood hazard, but this time we have an operational performance element to consider in the way of spillway gate inoperability. The PFMs being evaluated are overtopping, which is a function of both overtopping depth and overtopping duration, and slab jacking and spillway erosion, which is a function of peak spillway discharge. In order to calculate overtopping depth, we also need to obtain a resultant peak stage when we consider how the original peak stage from the stage frequency relationship is altered following potential spillway gate and operability. The PFMs being evaluated along with the non-breach variable are entered under the performance element and the consequences for the example, again, are uh, day and night exposure and life loss and economic cost. In step two, our first level is still devoted to the initiating event, a continuous function with one branch to represent the stage frequency relationship. This is assuming no gate reliability issues. The next level in the tree represents those spillway gate reliability issues and spillway gate inoperability. Since there are a finite number of gates and a discrete amount of combinations of inoperable gates at any given time, we use a discrete function for this level with four branches, zero spillway gates inoperable, one, two, and three spillway gates inoperable. As identified on the previous slide, we have a total of 
four transform functions required for this tree. And since each transform function is represented by its own level, we devote levels three through six specifically to those transform functions. The first function calculates the resultant peak stage following gate and operability in level three. Level four calculates overtopping depth. Level five calculates the overtopping duration. And level six calculates the peak spillway discharge. Levels seven through 10 are very similar to levels two through five in our previous example. They consist of a system response function, exposure function, and consequence functions for life loss and economic cost. Since wide range dam contains a discrete function, there may be opportunities to have collapsed nodes or pruned branches in the project of entry. We know that there are four branches in the tree for spillway gate and operability, and the event tree structure following those four branches is identical. So this allows us to collapse the nodes following spillway gate and operability for the one, two, and three gates and operable branches. Now, when considering branch pruning, the probability of occurrence of each branch must be considered to determine if any of the probabilities are significant. For wide range dam, the lowest probability of occurrence for any of the gate and operability scenarios is 0.04 or 4%. While this is certainly a small number when compared to the 80% probability that zero spillway gates will be inoperable, it's really not insignificant enough to warrant pruning that branch, especially because it's not extremely different from the probabilities of occurrence for the one gate and three gates inoperable scenarios. When we're looking at branch pruning, we generally need to see probabilities of occurrence that are several orders of magnitude less than any of the other branches before we consider pruning them. So in this example, we're not going to prune any of our branches. And when it's all said and done, we have our project of entry structure, and this is what we end up with graphically. Notice that it's significantly longer than the project of entry for Sharp Top Dam due to the introduction of the operational performance elements and the transform functions. And also note that the collapse nodes present for the branches in level two. So you can imagine what the size of the tree without those collapse nodes would be. It would be a very large tree. All of the event tree structure from this point over from level two over, this would need to be included one, two, three more times. So you can imagine if you're looking at that entire structure on a page, it would be very large, very small, and difficult to read. So that's where the collapse nodes really shine. All right, any questions on wide range dam on that example? All right, we have one more example. I'm gonna go through this a little bit more quickly because we're running short on time. This is for Oak Ridge Dam. A lot of the elements in this project are the same as our first two examples, but the biggest difference on this one is that we have a concern and operational performance element related to debris blockage of the gated spillway. So I wanna show you this example quickly to show you how we handle debris blockage and that operational performance element. So again, in step one, we identify our variables. Everything is, is or a lot of the, the elements are the same as the first two examples. We have a flood loading. We need transform variables of a resultant peak stage, overtopping depth, and overtopping duration. For potential failure modes, we're only evaluating overtopping, so we have overtopping in a non-breach branch. And then we have life loss and economic costs and exposure for our consequences. <clears throat> when we get to step two, we're assigning our, or building the event tree structure. So everything looks very similar again to the previous examples, but I wanna highlight level two. Level two represents spillway capacity reduction due to debris blockage. For this example, we're using a continuous function with only one branch to represent this variable. So what we're saying is that the spillway capacity can be reduced by an infinite number of percentages between 
and 100% depending on the amount of debris blockage present. We can also evaluate spillway capacity reduction due to debris blockage using a discrete function instead of a continuous function. So an example would be assigning spillway capacity reductions of 0%, 10%, 25%, 50%, and 50%, et cetera. We can do that depending on the level of the analysis, the quality of the available data, and the risk calculation software being used. So that's the main thing I wanted to highlight from this example is that spillway capacity reduction, we can evaluate that using a continuous function or a discrete function, depending on the needs and level of assessment that we're performing. And since we're evaluating spillway capacity reduction due to debris blockage as a continuous function, there aren't really any opportunities to have collapsed nodes or pruned branches. We don't have a discrete function for this example, so that's not really an option for us. And then finally, what we have is this project of entry. So notice we have two continuous functions represented by two fan symbols. We have one in level one for the stage frequency, and we have another one in state and level two for spillway capacity reduction due to debris blockage. Any questions on that third example? Would it be, say in level six you had multiple, more than just one additional branch, would you be able to just collapse those additional nodes there? kind of clean up the visual appeal, I guess? Yes, if you wanted to do that, you could, as we're gonna get into in a minute when I show the eventry toolbox for the project of entries. Um, that's, <clears throat> that's not something that you can do cleanly in the toolbox as of right now, and I'll talk about that why, but yes, you could do that. So the question is, as function type, continuous and discrete are types of variable or functions. However, system response, exposure, and transform are, and consequence are not. <clears throat> it's somewhat confusing. Yes, I understand that. Um, so really, when we say types of functions, what we're referring to are, what are the types of variables that are, are being represented by each of the levels in each of the branches? So when we say a system response function, Really, what we're referring to is <clears throat> anything that's captured within that system response level. And these probabilities, they are functions. They're represented by system response probabilities that we use our sub entries to elicit and calculate. So they, they are functions. I do understand the, the difference between continuous and discrete versus system response and consequences. I understand that. So. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by where can I find the detailed descriptions, so maybe follow up with what you're looking for specifically and we can provide some more information. All right. <clears throat> so now Quickly, we're gonna get into the toolbox and go through an overview of the project of entry tabs. I'm gonna do this pretty quickly. So the project of entry tabs are set up fairly similarly to the event tree tabs. We start off with the limitations for use here and you can read through those on your own. Um, we start again with step one, characterizing our project of entry. The project of entry toolbox allows for up to 12 levels and it allows up to 60 end nodes. So you will define each level by defining the number of branches, which is a drop down level. You can have up to six branches per level and a drop down menu to define the level as continuous or not. The third column here, if you want to have any collapse nodes, this is where you would specify yes or no, I want collapsed nodes at this level. And then at the end, this is a running tally of the number of end nodes that you're going to have. If you get above the allowable number of end nodes, that entire column will highlight orange and it'll tell you that the toolbox only allows a maximum of 60 end nodes and that not all end nodes will display in the project of entry graphic. 
Once you've characterized the project of entry in step one, you will define your level specific information in step two. So depending on the number of branches that you've assigned for each level, you will have a corresponding input for that level. So in level one, we said there's only one branch and it's representing our stage frequency. So we assign a stage frequency description to that branch for level one. Level two, we have three branches. This is a continuous or a discrete function that's representing the number of spillway gates inoperable for this specific project of entry. So we have zero, one, and two spillway gates inoperable. Levels three, four, five are transform functions, peak stage, overtopping depth, and overtopping duration. And then level six, we're identifying our system response functions. Level seven is exposure. And then levels eight and nine are consequences. The toolbox will automatically draw your project of entry structure and will assign your branch names in the appropriate places. So in this case, in the project of entry input, we said that we wanted a collapse we, we wanted collapse nodes at level three in the project of entry. So what that means is levels three and beyond in the project of entry structure are going to be collapsed for all but the first branch. So we have one spillway gate inoperable, two spillway gates inoperable, and you can see that a plus sign has been drawn to represent a collapsed node. Now, you'll notice that there's a lot of white space available between one and two gates. You can use these buttons up here to hide your collapsed rows or unhide all rows. So when you hide your collapsed rows, it condenses the project of entry graphic so that you can capture it and put it into a report. To address the question that we just got about could you add a collapse node after um, <coughs> the PFMs, yes, you can do that. One of the limitations of the toolbox is that you can only have one collapsed, or you can only have collapsed nodes on one level of the event tree. So if you try to have collapsed nodes in two places, you're gonna receive an error or a warning. However, if you try to collapse the nodes following the potential failure modes, this is what you're going to end up with. You're going to end up with life loss and economic costs. Now, you can do this, but the reason that I said that it may not be a good idea to do that is because you can see you only have one end node and it's green. So you only have one non-breach end node and you don't reflect any of your breach end nodes in the project of entry structure that are, are red nodes. <clears throat> so you can do this if you would really like to, as long as you describe that this, you know, all other branches in the tree represent um, failure nodes, but you may not want to do that. It can clean up the project of entry graphic, but it, it doesn't really reduce the amount of space that it takes up by that much. So are there any questions about the functionality of the project of entry tabs in the toolbox? There is one question in the chat. If the intent of the toolbox is to have a project of entry, what is the proper way to duplicate the of entry tab so you don't mess up the spreadsheet macros? There's not. You can't um, duplicate the tabs in the toolbox and have them still work. Uh, this toolbox is not built such that the of entry tabs feed into the project of entry tabs at all. So you can only create one of entry and one project of entry. If you want to create multiple of entries, you'll need to save each one as an individual workbook. Uh, Adam, could you show again how you unhide and hide the collapsed rules uh, in the spreadsheet? Yeah, so there's these buttons up at the top of the, 
of the project event tree tab, hide collapsed rows and unhide all rows. So when you have collapsed nodes, when you want to hide those rows, you will simply hit this button and the toolbox will hide the rows for you. And then when you want to unhide them, you just hit unhide all rows and they show up again. Okay, uh, when you hit the unhide the rows, uh, I don't see all the uh, level three, four, five, so on the branches. Yeah, uh, so hiding the rows is only going to get rid of the white space. If you want the entire inventory structure to show up, you need to go back to the project inventory input and where you see this yes under collapse, you need to change that to a no. And once you do that, the entire tree structure will show up. Oh, I see. Thank you. Thanks. How come for in the one spill gate inoperable, the non breach end nodes are not green? Boy, you know what? That's a good question. So I think the reason that I would give for that is that without getting too deep into the details, when you're looking at a project of entry in this format, these are, are actually non failure and failure branches, not technically non-breach and breach branches or non-breach and incremental branches. So when you have an, in, an inoperable spillway gate, the dam is not performing as it was intended. So it may not be a breach. However, that branch still represents a failure, if that makes sense. So for that reason, there are red nodes at those locations. All right. Um, I'm hopeful that, that you all will get the chance to jump in and use this toolbox during the exercises, and hopefully that, that clears up a lot of questions that you may have, or it may bring up additional questions that you have, and, and I'm happy to answer those questions as they come up. All right. Well, we appreciate you taking this course. That wraps up all of our presentation materials and exercises. So thank you for taking the course. We truly hope that it was beneficial and you got something out of it that you can take away and put into practice in your careers doing risk analysis.